So hi, my name is Chris. Um, I'm an engineer at Import.io. Uh, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what we think Import.io can offer you today uh, to help you with your, ha your hacks. So Import.io is basically a platform that makes it easier for people of all kinds of backgrounds to extract data from the web into a format that they can use more easily. So there's a lot of really useful data online, as I think all these people are just talking about, all these APIs have shown. But it's not always as easy as just connecting to a nice RESTful API and integrating an SDK with your application. There's a lot of data locked up in web pages, and it's very difficult to get hold of that information and integrate it in applications. It involves scraping and parsing XPaths and all kinds of nasty things like that. So what I want to do is show you a few of the tools that you can use, uh, the import IO provides, um, and hopefully you'll find a use for those for your applications today. So the first thing that I want to show you is what we call our extractor tool. So this basically takes semi-structured information from a web page and converts it into information that you can use in your app or in some other analysis tool. So imagine uh, you're building a, a property app, for example, to find properties for sale. Um, there's a lot of great property information online, notoriously difficult to get hold of through APIs, though. So um, I'm going to use a, a big American website called realtor.com, which has a lot of property information on it, properties for sale. And I'm in this tool now, which works a lot like a browser when there's an internet connection. When it's not, there's no internet connection, it works like a blank page. There we go. So um, we use this browser to navigate to our information, and then we can extract that information we, we need. So I'm just going to do a search. Oh, dear. Where's that going? Live demos. OK, so what I've got now is a page of search results from properties that are available for purchase in Santa Clara. I'm going to turn the extraction functionality on. And the way that we extract this data is simply by highlighting it. So I'm going to isolate each of the entities in the page in turn and add it as a selection. And that highlights it as one of the results, if you like, from the page. So do that with a couple. And it started to pick up those on the page automatically. Miss these examples because they look like they're laid out slightly differently. So now we go through, and the tools automatically recognized all of the search results that are on this page. The next thing we're going to want to do is extract some information from each of those results. So if we're building a property app, the address is probably going to be quite important. Ah, there we go. So I just highlight an example of an address, as it's a selection for this column, and the system's automatically extracted the same piece of information from all of the results for me. And it's copied that and put it in my table of data here. The next piece of information we're going to probably want is the price of the house. Uh, this is a number, so I'm just going to change the mapping slightly. If I just highlight the number here, add it as a selection, and not only is it extracted all the prices for us, it's also converted it into a whole number automatically, so we don't have to worry about that. The final thing is, if we're building an iPhone app or something, we're going to want it to look pretty, so we want, it, want the image for the result as well. I can select the image as a type. Uh, just click on the image here, add it as a selection. And now it's automatically extracted all of the images for those results as well. So now that we've got this table of information that we've extracted from the page, we want to do something with it. We could save this to the server, which I'll show you in a minute. There's also this copy table button. So if I just nip over to Excel, what it's done is copied that data onto the clipboard for me. I just paste it in, and as you can see, we've now got that structured information uh, in Excel. I can analyze that straight away. But what application developers are more interested in, we think, is accessing this through an API. So if I just nip over to our website, here's one I made earlier. So this is what we call a connector. And this does the search for us and extracts the results. And you can train that up using the tool I just showed you. Dealing with a really slow connection here, so it might take a second to load. So basically, once you've trained it to extract those results I showed you a minute ago, there's a couple of extra steps to train it how to use the search box. And then you can do a query response through our website like this, or you can integrate it into a RESTful API. So um, if I just search for. Miami. 
So what I'm showing you here is basically using our internal APIs. Um, you can use these APIs as well. We have client libraries available in JavaScript uh, and Java. Oh, there we go, finally got that data back. So these are the top properties for sale in Miami. Um, the data has also come back in JSON format, so we can integrate that pretty, pretty easily into applications. So I want to do a bit of coding now, and I want to show you how easy it is to integrate these data sources that we already have into your applications. So uh, another use case uh, might be uh, some kind of shopping search, so a price comparison, big thing at the moment, supermarkets competing over pricing. We've got some uh, connectors already available to do searches on popular websites. So we've got the Tesco one here. What I'm going to do is create a mix. This is essentially a, con a collection of connectors that you query at the same time. So I just click this big add button here. Oops. Call it food. So I'm adding this Tesco connector to my new mix. And at the moment, pretty plain because it's only got one connector in it. I'm going to show you how to use our JavaScript client library to integrate that mix into a basic HTML application. So the first step is to just include our client library. Stir from our CDN, so it'll be very quick. The next thing you need to do is authenticate. Uh, that's just a one-liner to provide your user ID and your API key, which you can get from our site. And the next thing we need to do is build our query. So because we're uh, on these shopping sites, uh, the input for them is the product name, and I'm going to use eggs in this example. And we just need to add in the mix ID here. Sorry, I shouldn't do this on multiple operating systems, really. So I just, oh. That's the mix ID. Paste it into the query. And it's a simple case of doing the query. This is another one liner. So you can actually integrate this in one script tag and two lines of code. So we're going to give it the query object. We just built just three lines above it. And it uses jQuery's promises. So we can just hook into events straight away. cheated a little bit this morning and wrote a bit more to help me out with this. So every time we get a data message back from one of the connectors, just show it on the page. Um, all that does down here is got a simple moustache template, which just renders the data as it comes out. So these are the outputs here. And that will render that out onto the page. Finally, we want to know when we're done. Uh, I think there's a, yeah, there's a loading thing. OK. So what this will now do is send the query off. Every time we get a data message, render it onto the page. And then when we're done, load the hiding spinner. So I'm just going to reload that. So hit the Go button. This is where it works or doesn't work. And in the background, it's doing that query on the Tesco site, which you, um, you saw me do a minute ago with Realtor. It's returned those data back, that data back, fortunately, and has rendered it into the page for me. But the key about mixes is being able to put more than one data source together. So on this mix page, you see I've got some recommendations on the right-hand side. So um, we might want to compare our prices between Tesco and Waitrose. That might be quite entertaining. Um, so I'm going to add this other connector into my mix. And without changing any of my code, that data source is now integrated into my application. So I can add it to my existing mix. OK, there we go. So my mix has now got Waitrose and Tesco in it. You can see here on the right-hand side. If I go back to the app, I don't even need to reload it. So I'm not changing any code. I've re-executed the query. And now I'm getting results for both Waitrose eggs and when it's finished loading. At the bottom here, search results for Tesco as well. So that's a really brief introduction into what it's possible to do with Import.io. Um, if you have any data sources that are online, HTML tables or any kind of semi-structured information on the web, uh, please come and find my colleague or me. Uh, we're both wearing the import hoodies, and we're sat over in the corner. There's Bamford. He's also called Chris, so just look for Chris from Import.io, and you'll find one of us. Um, and we really want to get lots of feedback from, from you today. Uh, we're really at the growth stage at the moment, and we really need application developers and people who are integrating data to give us as much feedback as possible. So if you'd like to give our platform a go, either just nip on import.io, or come and find one of us, and we're more than happy to help you get started. So is there any questions about what I've just shown you? There's a question here. Yeah, uh, just, uh, you know, you, you, you showed um, 
real estate uh, website, but it's not against uh, policy of website that uh, automatic uh, automatic extraction tool. It's not against uh, uh, policy websites so sometimes. Um. So that's a question that's got a very long-winded answer to it. We can talk about that in great detail. But briefly, I'll just say that Import.io acts as a proxy on behalf of the user. So we never do any requests that aren't triggered by a user request. We never do, um, uh, we never do anything automated. We don't um, store any of the data that we collect. We pass it straight through to the client. So it's acting more as a data proxy rather than any kind of scraping or storage mechanism. Yeah. But if you want to catch up with me on that afterwards, I'll be happy to go through it in great excruciating detail. But I, I think maybe we'll leave that out for now. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, could you show? Uh, it's a similar question, but some people do not like to use uh, some of the sites, do not like to use the rate. Yes. Uh, how do you deal with that? Okay. Um, is that a technical, from a technical point of view, or a yeah, marketing because, sales point of view? Uh, do you have some kind of proxying strategy? Because some sites really block you after some time. Um, Yes, so by and large, we, take an, we, we try and deal with that as much as we can, obviously. Sorry? I know this out of experience. Uh, yeah, so um, we try and provide as best availability as possible to the people who use us. Uh, again, that's kind of a similar vein to the previous question, so I'll be happy to talk to you about that afterwards, about the kind of strategies we do without giving away all of our uh, IP. Any other questions before I head off? Yes. So the question is, how resilient is the scraping? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the question is, how resilient is the scraping um, to how the page changes? So um, I don't know if anyone's ever actually written a scraper, but 50% of the effort is building it, and then 50% of the effort is maintaining it, because websites change, and even when they change a little bit, if, even if you've got reasonably clever X paths, there's going to be a nightmare to keep that up to date. Uh, the actual costs involved, and I think you can talk to Barnaby about this, because he uses our platform for doing a lot of his um, data retrieval. Um, the actual main maintenance cost of scrapers is the really, the really difficult thing. So we offer a number of tools for that. Obviously, you've seen the UI tool, which makes it really quick to build it, so that reduces your time into the market. And we also have some self-healing capability. So when you, uh, I didn't show it on the screen, but when you train a connector, you can also train it with some tests. And then that gives us basically a baseline so that we can adapt our algorithms if the page does change. And even if we can't adapt our algorithms, we'll send you a notification. You can just go and, and fix it yourself. So um, we, we like to think that it's significantly easier in the update phase, which is really where scrapers are expensive for businesses and, and individuals. Um, we like to think that that's where we can really offer a core benefit in terms of making it easy to maintain, this, maintain the connectors once you've built them. Uh, I'm, one last question, because I'm way over time, and I don't want to delay the robot. Uh, so the question was, um, what about dynamically um, generated websites, Ajax content, and so on? Um, by and large, we can deal with a lot of that. If there's a website doing something really, really weird, um, then uh, it's obviously difficult for anybody to deal with that. Um, but we can deal, by and large, with a, a lot of those kind of things. If you want, um, I would recommend talking to other Chris, because he's been fixing a lot of bugs around that kind of stuff recently in the past few days. So. Uh, um, yeah, so we can handle some of it to an extent, but it depends on how complex the website is and how complex the JavaScript is. Okay, as I said, uh, I will be over in the corner with other Chris, and so if anyone has any questions or any, wants any help or has any feedback, we'd really love to hear it, so please come and find us. Thanks very much. All right, let's hear it for Chris Alexander. Thank you very much, Chris.